So uh, thanks for inviting me here. I was excited to come back at any opportunity. I'm excited to come back to Stanford. And um, I, I was telling my husband last night, um, uh, I, I was like, do you remember how beautiful the campus was when, when we were there? And he's like, yes. And I, I'm like, believe it or not, it's like we were slumming it when we were there. It's <laughs> even prettier now. Like, Hashtag Stanford slumming. I don't know if there's such a thing, right? Uh, so anyway, so I'm excited to, to be here today uh, and to talk with you about uh, some of my research that's looking at the effects of English language learner reclassification policies. Um, so first, um, I, I want to give you, um, well, first I want to thank some people. So uh, I want to thank the, the funders for this uh, research. I'm going to talk about a few different projects. Uh, so the Spencer Foundation and IES have uh, funded these projects. And, and then also, um, I want to thank anyone who uh, has, uh, I want to say, suffered through, <laughs> through reading different drafts of these papers and has provided helpful uh, feedback. And also uh, to thank the, the state and district uh, Department of Education staff who uh, provided not only the data, but also their expertise in uh, understanding what's going on with the data and thinking about the policies and, and uh, the, uh, the implementation of, of the uh, findings that we have here. Uh, so I want to give you a quick overview of the papers I'm going to talk about today. So the first paper uh, was published in uh, EPA back in 2011, and it came out of my dissertation work here. Um, and so, so there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and that paper was kind of, it was laying the groundwork for uh, how we might go about thinking about the effects of reclassification. And I'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, uh, as, as a bit of a setup for the other two papers. Uh, and this was using, so it kind of lays out a theory, and then it also talks about the method that we could use, and then there's an empirical um, analysis that's uh, using data from one large urban school district in California. And then this uh, second paper has recently come out. It's, it's work done with Karen Thompson at Oregon State University, also a uh, Stanford alum. I was her TA for regression. and um, And... Uh, and she's wonderful. And uh, this is expanding on the, the previous study, and, and it's looking at um, the effects of reclassification policies when we have a shift in the policy and trying to understand uh, what effects we might observe there and, and what that might mean for how we think about um, the policies that are existing. Each of these uh, papers is using data from uh, a different large urban school district in California. Um, in this third paper that I'm going to talk about today, uh, also with Karen and then with a, a, a student at the uh, University of Illinois, um, what we have is data from an entire state. And we have actually data from two states, but um, I'm going to focus on one state in particular. And at the state level, they set the criteria for English learner reclassification. And then what we're going to see is what the effects are across different districts uh, within the state and see what we could then uh, learn from that. And I think that this is. Um, Thankfully, uh, it got accepted, and, and uh, it's going to be coming out soon. But it's, I think, particularly relevant as we think about uh, what's going to happen for English learner policies with uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, because there's, uh, there's a provision there that says that uh, reclassification procedures have to be standardized within states. It's not entirely clear if procedures is going to mean criteria or not. That time will tell with that. but. Um, but I think the, what we see, um, our findings from this paper, I think can help illuminate what we might expect to see in other states. OK. So now I've said the word reclassification a ton. And if you don't study it as much as I do, you're probably saying, what, what is reclassification? And why doesn't Joe explain it? And why should somebody study reclassification? Why it's an, an important topic? So if I had to describe reclassification uh, in one word, it would be change. So it's change at the surface level uh, in the label from English learner to reclassified fluent English proficient. So that's a change from when a student is deemed to be not proficient in English to when they are deemed to be suddenly proficient in English, right? And what happens then is um, there's a discontinuation, oftentimes, of uh, specialized uh, linguistic services that are intended for students when they're English learners. and um, Depending upon when the services are, are switched, it can also mean that there's a change in the teachers that the students are instructed uh, from and the peers that they're instructed with. So it's an entire bundle of change that happens for students. So it's not just a label change, right? Um, over uh, one-fifth of the current uh, 
U.S. student population in public schools um, comes from a, lame, uh, a home where a language other than English is spoken. Right? So these are language minority children, and these children are affected by reclassification policies and also classification policies that determine whether they're English learners in the first place. Right? So this is a, a large student population, and it's also a growing student population. It's projected to be about one-third of the uh, U.S. student population by 2050. And, um, and I point out, uh, currently, there's about two-thirds of students who are language minority children in LAUSD. This is going to be a district that we're looking at um, uh, for one of the analyses that I'm going to present to you. So we have this policy that is going to entail a whole bunch of change for students. It affects a large and growing uh, population of students. And so this line of work is really focused on this question. Do these policies help or hinder students? Um, and what could we do, as Josh pointed out, what could we do to uh, evaluate these uh, policies and also to improve them so that um, they're helping students have a, a more, uh, an easier flow from one setting to the next? Okay, so first we need to understand how a student moves from English learner status to reclassified fluent English proficient status. So I'm going to present to you a, like a flow chart for how we could how this works in California, and even though the state that I'm going to be using later isn't California, um, this can be generalized to uh, that other context. Uh, and I should also point out that this is really how reclassification worked. Um, pre-California getting rid of uh, the CSTELA, and soon they're going to be getting rid of the CELT uh, uh, as well. Uh, but this is how it worked. This is how it worked for when I was doing these analyses. So the student starts out as an English learner, and then um, each year they take um, a, a test that's the California Standards Test of English Language Arts that all students take. And then they also take a specialized uh, English language development test, the, California English Language Development Test uh, to assess their English proficiency. And that test has uh, three different subcomponents to it, uh, reading, listening, speaking, and writing. And so there's five scores in total that a student has to um, pass in any given year. So they have to pass all five of them in, like, simultaneously in that year. Uh, it's not like a combination, like you passed a few one year and then you pass the others the next year. Uh, if the student doesn't pass all of them, then the student remains an English learner and then has to go back next year and see if they can pass all five thresholds. If the student does pass all five thresholds, then the student becomes eligible for reclassification. They're not automatically reclassified. And now at that point, the teacher and school staff confer to decide whether or not the student should be reclassified. If they disapprove, then the student remains an English learner and then has to go back and try again may not pass all five tests the following year, right? Or may, and then may end up back there again. Um, but if they do approve um, for reclassification eligible students, then that's finally when a student gets reclassified. Okay, now if we're thinking about this um, from a policy standpoint, then policymakers are going to have uh, their strongest influence right here where they're determining what the tests are going to be and what the thresholds on those tests are going to be. And that's going to be really important because that's going to establish uh, two different sets of students, those who are reclassification eligible and those who are reclassification ineligible. Right? Okay, so uh, how I see this then, the policymaker's dilemma is where do they set the test-based criteria for reclassification eligibility since it's going to have a, prof a profound effect on a student's likelihood of reclassification. Okay, so in the uh, 2011 paper, uh, I won't talk about the 2011 paper much beyond this uh, kind of setup, but I, I laid out uh, a way of thinking about how a policy might, maker might think about where they would set the criteria and what the marginal effects of reclassification are. So I was arguing that really what policymakers would want is to have a smooth transition from the English learner setting to the reclassified fluent English proficient setting. So if we have this dimension of English proficiency on the x-axis, and the y-axis is just some later outcome, in this case it's next year's uh, CSTELA score, it could be graduation, it could be something uh, more long term. Um, and here at point A, if the policymaker were to set the threshold here, what happens is, um, this is when students are still benefiting from the uh, special, uh, specialized linguistic services that they're provided, right? That we think that they're supposed to benefit from, right? 
So if they were to be discontinued at that point, students would move from where they're benefiting to suddenly where they're no longer benef benefiting from the services, right? And we'd see a drop in, in achievement on next year's uh, test. And now, similarly, uh, up at this end, if, if uh, policymakers were to set the threshold here at point C, we'd also uh, experience something, well, we, we'd experience some sort of uh, discontinuity, but it would be a discontinuity kind of in the opposite way, right? So here, we think that students are at a high level of, of English proficiency. They no longer need the services uh, that might be provided to them uh, that are intended for students at low levels of English proficiency. So here, their time might be better spent on other academic activities, right? So once those services are discontinued, we might expect to see a jump up in achievement, right? Setting the threshold at either point A or point C uh, from a policymaking perspective is not ideal because you're going to have students here that uh, would be better served if they were in this environment, right? If they were in the EL environment. And that would continue all the way through here, right? And then we switch over to this setting where it's better to be uh, in the reclassified setting all throughout here. So really the ideal spot is at point B where there's a smooth transition from one setting to the other setting, right? So, um, so that's one scenario that I laid out in the 2011 paper and that's kind of what I thought was the model. The nice thing about it was uh, Karen and I had an opportunity to test this out with, um, with data from LAUSD. So what we're gonna do in this uh, next paper is we're exploiting a policy change that shifted the criteria for English learner reclassification. So we'll get to observe two different thresholds and we'll see what the effects look like at those two different thresholds. So, um, so um, what happens, I, I, so I said that there's five different tests that uh, English learners take. And the first one's the CSTELA, that's the test that everyone takes, the California Standards Test of English Language Arts. Um, then we have the California English Language Development Test. We have the overall and then the three uh, subcomponents. And then what happened is uh, there's two different time periods. There's pre-2007 and post-2007. And then um, there was a change that happened, okay? And there, there aren't any typos on this slide. I know it looks the same in both periods, but what happened is it's, it's not the same. So they didn't change the CSTELA uh, between the two periods. That was the same. Uh, these are the, the guidelines that, that um, California suggest, and these are what LAUSD has uh, adopted as their criteria. Um, and what happened was, so they kept the CSD ELA the same, but they rescaled the CELT uh, that took effect in 2006, 2007. And, the, and what they basically did is they made it harder to get the same nominal level. So, and they did this because they had, um, they were getting uh, some concerned teachers and administrators saying that students were, um, who were getting reclassified were not able to succeed when they were getting reclassified, that, that the criteria were just too low, right? So they had a technical working group together and that's what they concluded and then they ended up rescaling the CELT um, and they made it much more difficult to uh, meet the criteria uh, in the CELT. So, uh, so I told you that they did that, but now we want to see if they actually did that. So the first step is seeing um, here we have uh, data from LAUSD and all I'm showing you here is uh, the percent of English learners who attain a threshold in the different years that we have data for, right? So this right here, what I'm showing you, is for the CST ELA. Now this is the test that did not change between 2006, 2007, right? And so what we see is there's this nice continuity uh, going across here, right? And that's what we would expect. Okay, now we have uh, the CELT and the proportion of kids. And we can see that there's a drop between 2006, uh, so it's 2005, 2006 academic year, to the 2006, 2007 academic year. And there's a drop of 15 percentage points uh, right then. So they did make, you know, congratulations, they did make the test harder. That's what they set out to do and, and they did it. Um, so this is for grades uh, three to five. And then if we look at um, middle school, we see that there's a 19 percentage point drop. And then we see the biggest drop in high school, it's a 31 percentage point drop. And if you look at the, if you look at the way that the rescaling happened, it is made such that it, it becomes increasingly more difficult as, as the grade levels increase. Um, so, now we know that 
they had a, a lower threshold and then they moved it to a higher threshold uh, in between uh, the pre-2007 and post-2007 periods. So now we're gonna be able to test out um, what the effects of reclassification at the threshold were in the pre-2007 period. We're also gonna be able to test it again in the post-2007 period, and then we're gonna see if the policy change uh, had any effect on uh, subsequent outcomes for these students. And mainly what we wanna see is if, if we went from either a situation where we had null effects and then we have positive effects, or we went from a, you know, a situation where we had negative effects and then we moved to null effects, or did we overshoot, or what happened, okay? So the design for the study, what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, limit the analyses to only kids who met um, all of the SELT criteria, okay? So that means in the pre-2007 period, the SELT criteria were lower, so we're gonna take anyone who met the lower criteria, and then in the post-2007 period, we're, SELT criteria were higher, so we're gonna take anyone who met the higher bar. And then we're gonna work with the kids that may or may not have attained uh, the CST criteria, which remain the same in the two uh, policy periods. So, uh, so Sean and I have a paper that's looking at multiple rating score regression discontinuity. If you are familiar with that paper, if somebody made you read that, uh, then th this would be uh, a an example of a frontier regression discontinuity is what we're doing. So we're limiting it to all but the final uh, criteria here. Okay, so, um, so I kind of said already that it's a regression discontinuity, at least in some part. This is, the study, the design's a little bit more complicated, so it's gonna be what's called a comparative regression discontinuity with instrumental variables, or another way of thinking about it is uh, a difference in regression discontinuities with instrumental variables. Okay, so if that's just like a whole, I, I don't think for this crowd that's just a bunch of nonsense. I think you guys have, can like figure it out and everything, but uh, this kind of describes what we're doing here. So we're, we're focusing on students who barely did and did not attain uh, the final criterion. Uh, that's the regression discontinuity component. And then uh, we had differences in adherence to the policy. In, in here, what I mean here is like compliance with whether or not kids would get reclassified if they were reclassification eligible in the two different policy periods. So we wanna make sure that we're comparing apples to apples and so we're looking at reclassification effects, not um, an intent to treat in each of the two periods where there's uh, more people getting the treatment in one period versus the other. So in order to account for those differences, we have an instrumental variable component that we uh, employ in each of the two different policy periods. Um, so then we have our RDIV for each of the policy periods. And then what we're gonna do, it's just like a difference, right? So that's the comparative component. And then we also have a matched comparison group of kids who were never English learners. And we're gonna see what their effects were if they attained the criteria for reclassification. Um, and we're gonna be able to subtract off that uh, as well. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. I decided to go ahead and put a whole bunch of equations in for this crowd, so. Normally I don't, but I thought you guys would like that. So, uh, so we'll talk a bit about that too. Um, so, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, no, I, th I think that's a, a valid concern that, that we have two different complier populations, but whatever it is, it's, it's a product of, of the policy change. So it's kind of like they're selecting this at one threshold and they may have more compliers here because of the policy and they may have fewer compliers over here because of the policy. So I think that, that it's not as much of a concern because you're evaluating what would happen in the real world under a particular policy regime. Do you also compare just the two IPC estimates of students who don't match the rates? Um, Yeah, um, we didn't estimate 
that, I mean, we estimate the ITTs, but we didn't do the differencing. Um, actually, hold on a second. I know, right, right, right. No, I, th I think at some point we did, I think that that was one of the steps uh, along the way, but I can't remember if we did that in the final estimation. But yeah, I don't think we did. I think that might have been one of the appendix tables we don't have in there, but yeah. At some point we did do it and it, it was consistent with what you get with the RDIV, but I can't remember exactly if, if it was in the final version. But. Um, so what we're doing is we're limiting the, the data to the Latino, Latina uh, English learners in LAUSD. They make up uh, over 95% of English learners in LAUSD. Uh, we have data from 2000 uh, academic year 2002-03 to uh, 9 uh, And so this is over uh, uh, 600,000 students uh, in the data set that, that we're working with. I'm going to focus on the uh, effects for high school but the results for grades three to eight are in the paper. They're not particularly interesting. Um, so that's why I'll focus on the uh, high school stuff that's going on. Okay, so um, it, now I said that there would be some equations. So here I'm just gonna walk you through what we're doing with uh, the difference in RDIV. So first we're gonna have an intent to treat uh, estimate. And so this is on some particular outcome and the outcome is going to, we're just generically calling it Y here, right? Could, be next year's CSTELA score, or it could be uh, graduation in some cases. And then what we have here is just essentially your standard regression discontinuity, right? So here we have a, a generic functional form that we're going to change in a whole bunch of different ways. And then we have an indicator for whether or not you've attained uh, the cut score in the pre-2007 period, right? So the, um, the parameter of interest here is beta 1 pre, okay? So that's going to be our intent to treat in the pre-2007 period. Then we have a very similar uh, equation, except every this is going to be the intent to treat on whatever outcome in the post-2007 period. It's the same, except uh, all the superscripts are, are going to be changed. Um, so instead of pre, it's now post, right? So again, what we're interested in here is beta 1, OK? So we have beta 1 pre and beta 1 post. But like I said, um, there's going to be different compliance in the pre-period and the post-period. So again, we have another regression discontinuity, right? Except here, instead of uh, predicting some outcome like next year's CST ELA or graduation, we're instead gonna predict whether or not somebody is reclassified, right? So that's just zero one. So then what we're interested in here is the effect of, of attaining the criteria, the final criterion, on the increase in reclassification likelihood. So that's, um, that's alpha one pre. Then we have the same thing for the post period. And again, we're interested in alpha one post, okay? So now we're gonna put it all together and we have a difference in the complier average treatment effects or a difference in RDIVs. And we're just calling psi right here is the policy change effect, okay, uh, of reclassification. So we have the intent to treat effect in the post period, the compliance in the post period. So this gives us the uh, average treatment effect in the post period. Right, so that's the effect of reclassification on the kids who would be reclassified if they got the fi final criterion and wouldn't be reclassified if they didn't get the final criterion. We have that in the post period, and we're going to subtract off uh, the effect that we see in the pre period. Okay? And then this is whatever, I just have that as uh, deltas in there too. Okay, so, um, but this is the, the main. Uh, this is the main equation of what's going on for estimating the, the policy change effects, okay? So now I'm, I want to point out, uh, I want to complicate this just a little bit more. Uh, and this uh, slide is going to serve double duty. One, it, you might be looking at as, as a density check for a regression discontinuity. Um, but I, I also wanted to highlight how we're going to account for something else that happens. So when kids uh, attain the... Uh, CST score of 300, that means they move from being labeled below basic to basic, right? So there's a label, and John Pape's work uh, suggests that that RD effect of the label change can actually have some sort of effect on, on outcomes. Uh, so we want to make sure that we account for any sort of labeling effect that might happen, you know, regardless of whether or not kids are reclassified. The other thing is there might be tracking that occurs that happens outside of reclassification as well, right? Um, as, as a kid moves from below basic to basic, right? 
So we want to account for that, and so I'll show you how we're going to do that. So this right here is just showing you, uh, it's, it's basically a histogram of, of uh, the CST ELA scores among the kids who have met all the uh, CELT criteria, but you know, we're allowing this to vary. And this is uh, pooling across all the different years that we have data for and uh, the different grade levels. Uh, here it's uh, just grades 9 and 10. So it, it doesn't look like the smoothest thing here when you look at that, but if you break it down and you look at one particular grade level in one particular year, then things look smooth, right? So the reason we get this, these like little peaks and valleys there, is an artifact of essentially the psychometric scaling of it. And that some years it's possible to get uh, a 299, other years the closest you can get to a 299 is a 297, right? So there's some, some scaling differences that happen, and we're also kind of collapsing together a few different grades. Um, okay, but to reassure you a bit, you can see with the kids who are never English learners, these, we've limited it to uh, Latino, Latina, nev kids who are never English learners, so they were either initially fluent English proficient or uh, they were, don't come from a, uh, a home where a language other than English is spoken. We also did it leaving out that second group and we got similar results. So uh, this just gives us a little bit more power. But you can see that they have the same pattern, right? So what's, they don't have the same like density at everything, but you can see wherever you see a peak here, that's where you see a peak over here too, right? So, um, so what we're gonna do though is we're going to use uh, a propensity square matching and essentially inverse probability weighting so that we're going to match kids specifically within uh, particular grade year combinations who have exactly the same uh, scores uh, on the CST ELA but who are never English learners to those who are English learners so that we can reweight all of these kids to have exactly the same distribution as those kids. Okay, so we did that and uh, this is the reweighted never English learners and it looks identical to the English learners, okay? So then what we're gonna do is we're going to run a, a couple more RDs, because why not? And, uh, and so we, we're gonna run RDs on the reweighted never English learners and see if they have any sort of uh, effect estimate at the reclassification threshold and then we're gonna be able to subtract that off of what we estimate for the, um, the kids who actually are English learners. So we do that in the pre-2007 period, and then we do it also in the post-2007 period. So again, we're gonna take these kids and reweight them to have the same uh, distribution as those kids for their particular grade year combination. So everything is, is accounted for there. Okay, so this is where we left off before with the difference in the complier average treatment effects. And uh, this was our uh, policy change effect estimate. Now, uh, this is a mouthful. Uh, difference in inverse probability way comparison group adjusted complier average treatment effects. Okay, so that, to do that now, we have the kids who um, were English learners and we get their intent to treat effect estimate in the post 2007 period and we subtract off the intent to treat effect estimate of the kids who were never English learners in the post period. And then we scale it up by, so anything that's left over from this, we're arguing, is attributable to reclassification, so then we scale it up by the compliers in that period. We do the same thing uh, in the pre-period, and then we subtract that off. And again, what, isn't, what these uh, point estimates are intended to get at are any sort of non-reclassification effects that happen at the threshold. So it might be tracking, it might be some psychological uh, effect, right? doesn't matter, like however we estimate it, you get basically the, the same result, okay? So we went through all this hassle of doing this inverse probability weighing thing and it didn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Um, well, then you'd have to, so you're assuming that it's exactly, yeah. Yeah, they would be the same probably because you know, nothing was, nothing really pushed it around. So, um, but yeah, that's one more assumption to make, I guess, you know, that, that they would be the same. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. So, um, so now I said that um, 
the attaining the criteria um, affects the likelihood of reclassification. Now I'm going to show you that it actually does. So in the uh, pre-2007 period, this is again focusing on the, the results for high school, um, we see that there's a 50 percentage point increase uh, in the likelihood of reclassification for getting the final uh, criterion, right? So these are, anyone who's in here, the kids have already met four of the five criteria, right? And then this, this is now saying like, did you go from getting a, a 299 to getting a 300 on this final test, right? So, I mean, that's getting one multiple choice question, question correct or not, right? And there's a huge increase in the likelihood that kids get, are getting reclassified. And then this is just to, to drive home the point that these kids are basically the same. So the scale goes uh, from 150 to 600 points on the CST ELA. The kids who get 299, 0% chance of getting reclassified, and the kids who get 300, 50% chance of getting reclassified, okay? You guys have all seen RDs though, so. Uh, now in the uh, post-2007 period, <coughs> we see that there's uh, an, in, uh, an even bigger increase in the likelihood of, of reclassification, so it's a 75 percentage point increase. And this is getting at why the intent to treat effect uh, on the reclassification likelihood is different, and so the compliance is different in the two periods, and that's what we want to adjust for. Uh, one other thing that I want to point out, though, is, um, and Oda, I think this is getting at uh, your question, too, um, earlier about when you're like, hey, they're different populations, right? And so when we look at this separately, so we have um, 2004, 5, and 6 here, right? And then we have 7, 8, and 9. And what you see over the any individual period is that this creeps up each year. So there's just increasing pressure in California and in LAUSD to reclassify kids who meet the criteria, right? So that's going on each year. So it's not like it's this sudden jump, like, hey, the you know, reclassification increase is 50 percentage points, and suddenly it jumps up to 75. It's kind of this steady progression upward, right? You still might be worried, like, well, there's still different kids, right? But it's just to say that it's not entirely driven by this policy. There's, there's other factors at play here that are just saying, hey, the kids met the criteria. Why don't you reclassify them? Okay, so, um, so now I showed you uh, the intent to treat effects on reclassification likelihood. So that's you know, part of the equations that I showed you before. And now we want to see what the intent to treat effect is on, uh, on some outcome. Here, this is next year's uh, CST ELA score. So again, this is intent to treat, uh, also kind of getting at your question from before I did. So in the pre-2007 period, we see that there is a drop in next year's achievement uh, for kids who attain the final criterion, right? So, um, so next year's achievement goes down, right? So in this case, what we would think this is attributable to is the fact that the, these kids are much more likely to get reclassified, and that's what's driving uh, this effect. Okay, uh, now remember, that was when the criteria were lower for reclassification in the pre-2007 period. In the post-2007 period, we see that there's uh, pretty much a, a smooth continuation a across there, right? So it seems like there, there was a negative effect of reclassification, and now we have this smooth continuation a across um, the threshold. So putting everything together, now this is where you see the RDIVs and then the differencing off. So um, here, we're looking at next year's ELA test in standard deviation units, so you can interpret these as effect sizes. Uh, the effect of getting reclassified at the threshold in the pre-2007 period is uh, a decrease in, in uh, achievement test scores of uh, 0.13 standard deviations. So those kids are scoring uh, 0.13 standard deviations lower on next year's test. Then they raise the criteria, right? And uh, there's no um, significant effect of reclassification in the post-2007 period. But the policy change effect is significant, right? So essentially, the, the policy change removed the negative effects of reclassification by selecting a different uh, set of students. So that's looking at next year's uh, ELA test, but we can look a little bit further out too and see if we see this with another test, uh, uh, with another outcome as well. So we're looking at graduation. Here, this is in terms of probabilities. And we see in the pre-2007 period, there's a negative effect of reclassification on graduation. So these kids uh, are graduating at rates uh, that are nine percentage points lower than the, the kids who 
just barely failed to attain the criteria and weren't reclassified as a result of it. Uh, there's no effective reclassification on graduation in the post-2007 period. And then, again, we have the policy change effectively remove the reclassification penalty uh, on graduation. So if we kind of put this back into the, the figure that, that I laid out in the earlier paper, then what we can think of is uh, LAUSD and California more generally, uh, when they had the, the lower, well, I shouldn't say California more generally, because we don't know what the effects would be uh, in other contexts. But it were the criteria that California suggested and LAUSD implemented. Uh, at the, at, in the pre-2007 period, we kind of had this, we were down here at a lower threshold and we had this negative effect of reclassification. And then they raised the criteria and made it more difficult to get reclassified. And then we kind of are over here where we really are, are very close to a null effect of reclassification, not only on next year's achievement test, but also on uh, graduation outcomes, okay? So the, yeah, the paper has a whole bunch of different kinds of robustness checks. I'm not going to talk about them. But if, if you're interested, it really is one of those papers where there's like, I don't know, I think, I think we had like 30 some odd uh, appendices tables, but um, the editor asked that we cut it down to 20 something, I think. So, uh, but it, the results are, are very robust. Mm -hmm. Just a quick question, I was going to ask a lot of people, but I was curious, the benefit impact estimates, uh, the difference in two or uh, three minimum treated estimates, so you've got mm -hmm. all these different first stages, Uh, we did seemingly unrelated estimates there. And um, we also uh, did it with uh, bootstrapping sometimes, and we got pretty similar results, so it was just easier to do the seemingly unrelated uh, regression estimates. And were you accommodating your clustering? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, there was, we were, we were clustering uh, too. Um, I can't remember if it was at the school level. Oh, it was, it was, thank you, it was, <laughs> thank you, I'm so help, uh, appreciative that you had this there. So yeah, so we clustered on the rating variable because they were kind of discrete, um, yeah. So that's what we did. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know that. Um, is it at all possible that some of this is like a nutrition issue? Like in the CV period, I uh, scored 299, and then uh, in about five weeks, it's like this way, but there's just like no possible response to it. Whereas in the post period, I'm not, it's not quite so bad. Yeah, so that is definitely not the case for um, for the next year's uh, achievements. Definitely not the case for this, because we have to have kids uh, who have a prior test score, a current test score, and next year's test score, right? Uh, and for graduation, I don't think we restricted it further to make sure that we had graduation data on them. Um, so there might be a little bit of what you're talking about uh, going on, but I'm, I don't think it would be much of a problem if it is going on. And it's also very consistent with, uh, with the other outcome that we're looking at. It's a 9% difference in, in the graduation probability between those who were at one threshold and those who were 9% so no, of those who uh, uh, graduate did. Uh, a 9% point difference is what it is. So I, I, I don't know exact, off the top of my head exactly what the, the graduation rate was at the threshold, but let's say it was 59 percentage points, right, uh, just, bef just before, right, and then those uh, who attained the criteria and were reclassified, it'd be 50 percentage points. Uh, 
Um, yeah, no, it's, I mean, I don't know exactly what the, the mechanism is that explains why the kids are graduating at such lower rates. I think that is going to involve a, a much more in-depth qualitative analysis than, than we could do with these data. And in this case, it was also really retrospective. Um, well, it, it'd be a little hard, though, to, to um, like, I think what's probably going on is, and this is just me hypothesizing, I think that there's different supports that are in place for the kids who are English learners versus the kids who aren't English learners. Different expectations uh, that could be in place, too. Um, when the criteria are made more difficult, um, I think that what was going on was there was a change in the expectations of the teachers who were uh, educating the kids who were reclassified. Um, because we, we performed, uh, well, like I said, we performed a whole bunch of different robustness checks. And this one, it, the last one right here, we were kind of equating the test thresholds. Kind of what I mean here is um, we were restricting the analyses to, to kids who, um, um, in the pre-period, would have met the post-period threshold, right? So we, we got rid of any of the kids below Right, who, who, like the kids in the pre-period who met their criteria, right? We said, okay, some of these kids would have met the, the more uh, rigorous criteria and others wouldn't, right? So we only kept the kids who would have met the post-2007 criteria, right? And we looked at what the effects were for those kids too. Uh, and what we see is there's a negative effect of reclassification on those kids too. Which suggests that it's not entirely a, a story of changing the threshold, right? And just saying, oh, well, we're selecting different kids there's something else going on. But that something else that's going on is caused by the policy because there was nothing else that, that we could find and there was nothing that anyone that we talked to in LAUSD could, could think of that would have led to these different shifts, right? Um, there's a couple other things that we were noticing too, which is um, we were kind of looking at cohorts of kids who were a couple years prior to meeting the criteria and those who, um, who we get closer to meeting the criteria. And what you see is the more exposure that they have to the kids in the post-2007 period, the closer their outcomes get to those kids too. Which seems to me to suggest that, that it is more of, of, an, of an expectation kind of change that's going on or, or something more whole scale that, that's changing for, for these kids. And it's not just a are we selecting kids at this threshold or that threshold? Um, we didn't do that explicitly. Um, we kind of did that a little bit, though, implicitly by um, by saying um, what happens if we estimate the effect at the threshold, but not as regression discontinuity, kind of as adjusting away things? Because the, the problem is there's the selection bias in there, right? So if, if you don't uh, evaluate it as an RD, but more as kind of adjusting away those things, then it has the selection built into it. Um, and what happens there is you see that um, the effect estimates are more positive for anyone who gets reclassified in the pre-period or the post-period. But that makes sense because it's the selection that's going on. So the better kids are being selected to be reclassified uh, versus not. Yeah, so this, um, when we get to, um, here we're looking at the effects in, uh, in high school. So it, we're really they're getting reclassified in uh, grade 9 or grade 10 because we need to be able to look at their test scores in grade 11, right? Um, and what you see over time is that the CELT uh, plays a bigger role uh, in restricting kids uh, early on but that that shifts over time to be the CST that, that plays a, a bigger role. Um, but um, there's some work out of uh, PPIC that's uh, looking at districts where they have different criteria, right? Where they, they made it so that the CELT uh, is a higher threshold or the CST is a higher threshold, and that does 
you know, as, as you would expect, it shifts which test uh, plays a bigger role, whichever one is just harder. But more generally, what you see is that there's a shift away from the cell towards the CST, and that that's what, what holds it. But these are huge differences, though, in terms of um, how much more difficult they made the, uh, the, uh, the CELT. Um, so if you're looking at kids at the threshold, uh, we're talking like over a third of a standard deviation difference in terms of, of um, CELT performance difference that's required uh, at the threshold. It, it's, it's pretty big. Um, uh, and I, I wanted to say one other thing related to um, the expectations thing, which is I do think that that's probably more what's going on. When we think about RDs in, in the 2011 paper and more generally when we think about RDs, we think that we're estimating the effects you know, at this particular margin. And you might think, oh, well, the effect was negative here or the effect was positive here. So we could shift things because the marginal kid would have you know, this particular type, you know, they would either benefit a little bit or they wouldn't benefit over here, so we want to shift things a little bit. What California did, though, they didn't shift things at the margin. They really made it much more difficult for kids to attain the CELT uh, criterion. So I, I think that, you know, we need to think, did this radically change um, the way that teachers are instructing English learners or the perceptions that they have of the kids? Um, or the way that the, uh, the peer group uh, is structured. And we unfortunately don't have data on, um, you know, that's linking individual students to classrooms or anything, so we can't look at peer effects uh, for this. But that's another possible mechanism of, of what's going on that's shifting this. There was a question? Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, so um, what I have here is, so the 2000, so the pre-2007, those would have been kids who were uh, reclassified in ninth grade or 10th grade uh, pre-2007. So I think they would be graduating, you know, yeah, just, just after the, the recession ends up hitting. So anyone would be affected by that, I think, to, to some extent. Um, these kids, would be hit with it uh, suddenly, whereas these kids would have more time to plan for it, I think, if that's what's going on. But it would have to be something that, you know, that affects the kids on the margin differently, um, which I guess is possible, but I'm not entirely sure how that would happen um, as a, yeah. But it is something to think about, though. I mean, we have these, these bigger macro level things that are affecting kids, so. Um, okay, so um, so um, I'll talk about the policy implications of this paper, and then I'll move on to the third paper, and you can ask any other questions that you have related to any of these papers, too. Um, okay, so the policy implications so far, uh, I think one important takeaway, uh, and it seems, I'm sure, very obvious to, to you right now, that reclassification can have effects. And I think this is an important policy takeaway because if we look at a lot of uh, reclassification policies uh, and the way that people talk about reclassification, English learners, it's very much saying, uh, focused on let's get kids reclassified, right? And let's get kids out of uh, English learner status, right? Now that makes sense because, you know, it, it's, it's correlated with English language proficiency and you want to make sure that the kids are achieving and they have English language proficiency, right? But it's, it's not entirely that because you can shift the criteria, right? So it's not synonymous with English language proficiency. We just tend to think of it as that way because we've determined that these are the particular thresholds that are going to count as English proficient suddenly or not English proficient, right? So um, this is just to say that we shouldn't necessarily look at reclassification uh, as some innocuous yardstick by which we could judge the effectiveness of other uh, programs such as bilingual education or structured English immersion, right? But rather to think reclassification itself can be uh, a particular bundle change and some, something that can produce a, an effect. This can sometimes be a positive effect. I put that in quotes because positive effect isn't necessarily positive. It's positive for the kids who are getting out, but anyone who's left in, it's a negative effect for, right? And then it could also be negative effects. Uh, 
which it, you know you could also put negative in quotes. It's negative for some kids, but it's positive for those who are left in. But regardless, it's not a smooth transition if you see either positive or negative effects. You don't always see positive or negative. Sometimes you see null. If you see null, it doesn't necessarily tell you that you don't know if anything's changing for starters. You don't know if it's good to good or bad to bad. And so it doesn't tell you what else is going on. It just helps you. Um, you know, if you see uh, evidence of a discontinuity, then that, I think, gives you more insights into what you need to, to look into as opposed to seeing null effects. Regardless, reclassification can have effects, and I think we need to think about that a little differently. Um, the second point uh, is I think this paper suggests that policymakers can correct misaligned policies, right? So we had, they thought that the criteria were too low. They raised the criteria, and we, we saw that they went from negative effects of reclassification to null effects of reclassification. It's not guaranteed that they were going to hit, you know, null effects of reclassification, right? They could have overshot, they could have undershot, there could have been something else, right? But the policy change itself, in this case, plausibly induced this effect uh, and removed the negative effects that we were seeing for reclassification. It's also potential, though, it's not necessarily like this can only be achieved through policy changes. It can also be achieved through uh, programmatic changes, right? Or um, you know, any sort of expectation or, or types of, there's other ways that it could be changed. There's other mechanisms, but um, at least potentially, but we don't have any evidence to suggest that, um, you know, that studying those particular mechanisms uh, or instructional changes. But it's, you know, good to keep in mind that you could, there's other ways to, to correct misalignment. And so I think finally, uh, this is important, uh, point to the importance of having uh, alignment between the assessments and the um, and the instruction, right? So, really, you could, you know, I've been showing these graphics where you have, not to go back to this again, but where it's like, oh, well, you have, you could set the threshold here, and this would be too low, or you could set the threshold here, and this would be too high, so you want the sweet spot, right? But the thing is, all of this operates under thinking like there's two different kinds of instructional programs that are kind of static. And it's not necessarily that everything is static or that there's only two different types of instructional uh, programs in place, right? So really, all, all you'd have to do, if, if the threshold was set here, you wouldn't have to move the threshold. You can just change the instruction and you can provide supports to kids who are getting reclassified, right? So you can ease the transition in different ways. It's not all about the threshold. But if we're going to have these thresholds that have these uh, consequences for students, then you want to think, well, how can we make sure that these thresholds actually aren't so consequential if they're things that we can help to smooth across these, these boundaries? So that's what um, I'm trying to get at with this. And, and I think what the RD is, is helping you identify is if you see uh, evidence of misalignment. It doesn't necessarily help, again, with this because you don't know if necessarily things are, are changing. But it makes you feel a little bit better uh, if you see something like that, maybe. But it might be a false sense of... Of, uh, of security. Okay, so, so far, um, I've talked a, a bit about theory and evidence as to how policymakers uh, can improve transitions for English language learners, but there's a whole bunch of, of questions that are left unanswered. And one of them is, um, should policymakers establish one threshold or should they have many thresholds, right? And another way of asking this question is, um, is there evidence of threshold effect heterogeneity? Okay, so if we have the same threshold, would we see different effects for different kids or uh, different school systems? And so this is uh, a question that uh, Karen and Martha and I are addressing uh, in the most recent paper. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so what we're doing to, to address this question is we're going to look at effects of reclassification in two different states. Uh, we have state A. I'm not really going to talk about state A because state A has um, multiple different pathways through which kids can get reclassified, and we only had data on one of those pathways, and it was a very messy pathway that some districts used as their main uh, way of reclassifying kids, and then other districts didn't use uh, that pathway at all. Then we have uh, data from another state, um, I'm just calling state B here, and this one had one threshold on an English language proficiency test, um, and that was the sole criterion that the state established um, that said, you know, they said that this is what students have to make, uh, meet in order to uh, get reclassified. Okay, so that's the one we're going to be focusing on. 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to combine uh, the regression discontinuity IVs that I've been talking about uh, with meta-analysis to estimate um, statewide average effects, um, but also importantly to see if there's um, between district variability so we can see if there's heterogeneity of effects at the same threshold. And like I was saying, I think this is really important because you know, we had done this work already and then ESSA comes along and uh, says, okay, for English learners, there needs to be this standardized reclassification procedure, right? Which again, could be interpreted as reclassification criteria. So we have a state that we're working with where there is this uh, standardized uh, criterion and then we wanna see, well, what are the different effects and what can we learn from this? So um, there's a few more equations here. So um, here we want to estimate both the statewide average effects and then we also want to estimate the between district uh, variance in the effects. So um, first, um, we're going to look at uh, district specific reclassification likelihood changes. Uh, so again, it's going to be another RD. So this part inside of uh, this set of parentheses is just your standard RD but it's indexed by uh, particular districts, okay? So then what we uh, have is, so here we just have like your test score, uh, the uh, quadratic, and then we have being attaining the criterion and interacted with uh, the linear and quadratic terms. And then we have um, whether or not you attain the criterion, right? And then this indicator right here, it's a dummy for whether or not a kid is in a particular district. So it essentially turns on and off the inner uh, equation there, the inner RD uh, for each uh, district, depending upon whether or not the kid's in that district. So everything's estimated simultaneously, but there's, you can kind of think of it as a, as a whole bunch of RDs with a lot of interactions. It's really what it is. Um, and then in some equations, we have, um, we have uh, some covariates in there, and there's graded by your fixed effects. Okay, so that's predicting uh, reclassification likelihood and how that changes at the threshold. And so uh, this psi one and then D for each one of the capital D districts that we have, okay? So we're gonna have, I think in some examples you'll see like there's 42 districts, so we're gonna have 42 different uh, estimates of, of psi one, okay? And uh, so that's, did I turn that off? No, okay. Um, okay. So. That's the first uh, stage. And then the second stage, um, we're gonna have the district specific reclassification effects. So it's a similar equation, except now we're plugging in the uh, predicted values of reclassification here, okay? And then uh, what we're interested in then are the district specific uh, effects here, okay? So the phi one Ds. Okay, then uh, once we have all those estimates, we can estimate the, uh, using meta-analysis, and it's just a, a random effects meta-analysis here where it's precision weighted by the uh, precision of the particular district effects. And uh, we have, so here we have uh, our district specific reclassification likelihood effects, and this is gonna be our average. And then if we get the variance of, of the error terms here, uh, then this is gonna tell us if there's the extent to which there's hetero heterogeneity uh, across districts in their compliance with uh, reclassification uh, across the state. And then similarly, we're gonna be able to do the same thing uh, for the reclassification effects, okay? So this is gonna allow us to get both the average effect estimates and then the variance of each of these terms is going to give us the between district uh, heterogeneity. Okay, so uh, the first thing we're gonna look at here is uh, a, a big mess of lines. Uh, so here we have the prior year English language proficiency score, and then uh, we have kids who are scoring uh, up to one standard deviation below and then one standard deviation above. And each one of these lines, there's a pair, right? So there's one over here and then one that matches it over here. And we wanna see what the uh, increase in likelihood of reclassification is. So I pointed, I'm gonna point out the state average increase is 57 percentage points. Um, so the policy on average in the state is having an effect on the likelihood of kids getting reclassified. But there's some districts, um, so this one that's like a dash dot line uh, is matched up there, and that's an 80 percentage point increase in the likelihood of reclassification for attaining the same criterion. And then there's other districts where there's uh, only a 20 percentage point increase uh, in the likelihood of reclassification. And I pulled out two districts that we had uh, a fair amount of data on, so they were 
very reliable, stable estimates. Um, okay, so what we could see from this is the policy is having an effect on the likelihood of reclassification, right? But there's a whole bunch of heterogeneity uh, in, in the extent to which districts are, are conforming with reclassification there. So the state's uniform reclassification criteria appear to be implemented to strikingly different degrees across the state. And then the next thing that we want to look at is um, what do the effects on graduation look like? Okay. So uh, to do that, so this is the final result. Uh, each one of these uh, uh, lines here th that we have uh, vertically uh, aligned here is, uh, is the estimated effect of reclassification on the kids who, you know, it's the RDIV estimate. So this is the complier average treatment effect of reclassification at the threshold um, for um, the likelihood of um, the graduation effect, sorry, the likely, <laughs> the effect of reclassification on graduation, right? So up here we uh, have some districts where if you, basically, the kids who are not reclassified are, um, the kids who are not reclassified are much more likely to graduate than the kids who are reclassified. And then we have the opposite going on over here, where the kids who are reclassified are much more likely to graduate than those who aren't. And then we have a whole bunch of districts in the middle where reclassification isn't really having much of it on graduation likelihood. So on average, what we see is if you kind of take this approach of, well, let's look, look at um, the criteria and see what the threshold effects are and then see if the point is leading to on average, you know, large positive or large negative effects, we get basically a null effect of, of reclassification on average in the state. But there's significant heterogeneity of effects across the different districts, right? So in the top districts, uh, it's much better to remain an English learner in those districts. And then in the bottom districts over here, it's much better to exit EL status, okay? So um, in general, you know, if we interpret ESSA to be uh, common uh, reclassification criteria, then you might say, well, this is kind of like a one-size-fits-all uh, reclassification policy, and is this a positive, is this a good thing or a bad thing? You might look at these results and you might say, oh, well, that's, it's definitely a bad thing, right? But I'm not sure if I would necessarily reach that conclusion right away. I think, uh, you know, we need to question, like, well, maybe there's some positive things uh, related to the common criteria, right? One thing we could, we have common criteria, we as researchers can learn what's going on in some districts and see, well, what might be, what might we be able to learn from those districts and uh, import to other districts and see how we could improve uh, uh, educational outcomes in those other districts. Another thing, you know, if you think about practically as uh, kids move from one district boundary to another, you don't want them to, to be English learners in one and then to suddenly not be English learners in another or vice versa. So, um, and there's um, uh, Gary Cook and Robert Linquanti have written a ton on uh, the benefits of having common uh, criteria. So I would suggest you, you read that. So uh, if you're interested in this topic. Uh, so I think we need to think more like, well, maybe we want, we want to keep this, but what we need to do is we need to think about um, providing tailored supports to either specific students or to specific schools or districts that seem to be struggling with uh, having smoother transitions of students, right, uh, across the reclassification threshold. So, um, so to answer that, then, we need to say, well, what explains the variation in, uh, in reclassification uh, effects? And so we, we explored this a bit. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about how we explored this and what we were finding. Uh, well, I wasn't planning on going into detail, but there's a little bit more time, but I won't bore you uh, with going into it. Basically, we couldn't find much in terms of what was explaining the variation. So we looked at uh, student-level covariates, like uh, time as an English learner. Um, so th you know, the literature is suggesting that that would uh, predict um, reclassification effects, and it, it wasn't. Um, we were also looking to see if districts that were more likely to reclassify kids who attain the criteria, um, you know, like the one that had an increase of 80 percentage points, if that was a district where there were just more positive effects of reclassification. Because <coughs> you would think 
those that think that there's a more positive effect of reclassification might be more likely to actually reclassify kids if they met the criteria. And if they thought that there was a negative effect of reclassification, then they might be less likely to reclassify them, right? Absolutely no relationship. Um, nothing was significant. Some of the point estimates were, we had an equal number of point estimates that were positive and were negative. So nothing was going on uh, with that. Um, we were kind of left with, um, we had contacted uh, some district level and uh, state level administrators to see why they thought particular things might be going on. We contacted uh, in one district a, an EL coordinator for the district. We didn't say what the effects of reclassification we were getting were. In this case, they were positive effects of reclassification on both graduation and next year's uh, test scores. And uh, this person explained to us that during uh, the time that we had the data, uh, the EL coordinator and main teacher at, uh, at the main high school there um, was chronically ill and was out of school most of the, the time and then when she was present she wasn't particularly effective. So she thought, this person thought it would have been positive to exit English learner status and there would be better outcomes for those students and that, you know, that is consistent with what we were finding. So in some cases, it might not necessarily be, uh, you know, what we think of as instructional programs. It might just be like these idiosyncratic differences that are going on that are specific to uh, particular districts. But regardless, these are things that, that we need to investigate further to see, is it, you know, this, this widespread instructional program difference? Are English learners or former English learners being treated very differently in schools um, or are they these particular uh, idiosyncratic things? Or when we see evidence of smooth transitions, is there nothing going on? Uh, we started to look a bit into what's going on for kids where we see smooth transitions, and there actually are uh, a lot of programmatic changes. This is more Karen is exploring this. Uh, but she has said, nope, there's definitely uh, big differences in what kids experience in the EL setting and the reclassified setting. So it's not the case that nothing is changing for them, it's just that they have a particular system in place where they are smooth transitions. So, um, so that was a little bit to say what doesn't really explain uh, what's going on in, in the variation. And now what we're exploring through more qualitative uh, methods is we're trying to see what is going on. So we're, we're trying to go into the districts where we see either positive or negative effects. It doesn't always work out. Sometimes we can't get into those districts or um, for certain political reasons, um, we can get into other districts. And, uh, but you know, that's how things work. And, um, and we're trying to, to now understand um, what might be systematically going on in particular districts that would explain these results. One of the challenges and problems with this, though, is that the data, they're not particularly old, um, but they are a couple years old. And sometimes there's, there've been a lot of changes in, in those districts uh, in the intervening years. So this is, in this case, is, we were coming at this uh, from slightly different perspectives, uh, but I think now going forward, we, we will be planning a study where that's built in from the very beginning, where we're looking at what the uh, effects are at the threshold um, and trying to identify the kids that are right at the threshold and trying to see um, what's changing qualitatively and then also seeing what the quantitative effects are. Okay, so I had mentioned uh, before what the the policy effects were from before, reclassification can have effects, policymakers can correct misaligned policies, and how this work is kind of pointing to the importance of having this alignment between uh, the assessments and uh, the instruction. So some uh, additional policy implications and some next steps for this work are, um, one, obviously, uh, even at the same threshold, we can have uh, very different effects of reclassification, and I think future work really needs to consider heterogeneity of effects. It, it hasn't to this point, I mean, there isn't that much work that, that's been done on this topic that's looking at the effects at thresholds. I think I've presented about probably half of the work today that's, that's been done on this. Um, and Alana Umansky, who you know, uh, is doing some other work on, on this topic too. But I think really moving forward, we need to think about heterogeneity. What's, what's moderating the effects either at the student level or at the school or district level to the extent that we can measure these things. Um, uh, you know, if, if we want to have common threshold, common criteria, then we need to think about how can we 
keep the common criteria, but recognizing that heterogeneity is almost certainly going to occur, how can we use these types of methods to think about realigning services um, so that we can tailor instruction and services to provide smoother transitions for students across the, uh, the thresholds? And as I mentioned, I think uh, you know, we need to have mixed methods research that's doing this. But I don't necessarily think you know, any sort of mixed methods research. I think really uh, what, we, what we need is mixed methods research that's kind of coming at it with uh, this kind of RD mentality of, of well, let's look at what's going on to kids that are at the threshold. And because and, you know, it's, it's difficult to go in and to, um, to collect large amounts of qualitative data at kids all across the English language uh, development scale, right? So this would help us focus in on the kids that are at the, the threshold and then align the, the methods to focus um, and, and see what's going on for, for this particular subset of students. And that'll help us understand the mechanisms and moderators more. Uh, and I've already mentioned this. I, I think that this work, uh, particularly the, the most recent paper, is really helping us think through what we might expect uh, to see it with, with the Every Student Succeeds Act. And when we have standardization of of procedures, is this going to be standardization of criteria, and then what, what's that going to mean for how we need to think about uh, making sure that students are having um, smooth transitions. So one thing that, that I pointed out here was the state that, that we were uh, looking at, where we saw the heterogeneity of effects, that, that was with a threshold that was already in place. Now if we suddenly move from each individual district having their own criteria, right, to having some sort of standardized criteria, <laughs> we might think about, well, what was going on with, with LAUSD, right, where they were at one particular threshold, shifted the threshold, and there's a very different effect of reclassification. Something like that might happen uh, across districts, uh, in particular states, where they have, where the districts have kind of worked out what their particular criteria and uh, instructional alignment is going to be, and now we're going to shift their criteria, and then they'll be essentially thrown into a state of disequilibrium, and then they have to get back. Um, so we might expect at least some short-term um, disruptions uh, in this 